Hello, everyone, and welcome. Kara McGonigal here with the Child Welfare League of Canada. We've got truly another fantastic event lined up for you today with Faye Johnstone, who is a principal consultant with Wisdom to Action. Before we go ahead and dive into our event, a few brief housekeeping details that I want to bring your attention to. The first is that you'll notice that you've got a, a fair bit of information on the screen in front of you. Each individual window that popped up when you logged into the platform, you can move those windows around, minimize them, resize them, uh, essentially uh, change things up to suit how you would like to engage with us today. The round blue and white icons that you see right at the bottom of your screen all in a row also give you access into the resources that are available to you. This includes a, a copy of the slide deck and a question and answer function. If you are using that question and answer box, note that only the presentation team can see your questions. They aren't visible to the wider audience. If you are looking to receive a certificate of attendance for participating in today's webinar, keep an eye out on your email. We'll be sending it to you directly following the event. Finally, Faye's presentation is going to run for up to 55 minutes. We've got a, about an hour together today with time allocated for questions both throughout her talk and then at the end of our session. Go ahead, please, and submit your questions for Faye into that Q&A box at any time. And, and I know she'll certainly do her best to, to take up as many as she possibly can. With that, it's truly my pleasure to uh, say welcome uh, to Faye and, and pass the floor over. Awesome. Hello, uh, and thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it is an honor to be here with everybody uh, talking through uh, raising the bar and how we can do better by, for, and with uh, 2S LGBTQ communities uh, in our community health and social services. Um, I also, uh, again, do want to thank the Canadian or the Child Welfare League of Canada, as well as the Canadian Association of Social Workers uh, for putting on this, these phenomenal events. Um, this is actually the second time that I've had the pleasure of uh, facilitating through this uh, platform and with uh, you wonderful folks, um, and it is an honor, and I'm really thrilled that they are doing this and offering these kinds of um, opportunities for providers uh, across uh, the country. I also do want to say and put on the table that there is a two-second delay um, in my audio um, and my uh, video at the moment. So um, I'm looking at myself uh, as you are, and I can see the delay, and uh, we will do our best to work with it. Um, it mostly is just um, should make a difference in terms of the actual webinar itself. Um, so let's get right into it. So we are here to talk about an implementation-based approach to 2S LGBTQ inclusion uh, in community health and social services. Before I get any more into it, I do want to acknowledge that Wisdom to Action, uh, the company that I work for, is located and was started in uh, Kitchuk, uh, Kitchuk, uh, in Halifax, in Mi'kma'ki, uh, or what is traditionally today known as Nova Scotia. Um, this is, uh, or was, or Halifax is the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, the settlers um, and um, other folks on this land have a responsibility to abide by the treaties of their land. Um, I do also want to acknowledge that I am joining today from Ottawa, also known as uh, unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin territory. Um, and throughout this webinar and all of our work on inclusion, um, or all of our work in general in community health and social services, I think it's important for us to acknowledge the land that we're on and the histories of colonialism on that land, uh, and to acknowledge how conversations around gender and sexuality are intimately connected and um, interlocked with uh, conversations around colonialism. Um, we cannot talk about gender and sexuality on this land without acknowledging the ways in which colonialism violently imposed uh, extremely rigid and um, traumatic, I would say, uh, gender and sexuality systems um, on the peoples of this land, and that is part of a colonial process, and it is our obligation then when talking about gender and sexuality uh, to resist that and, and, and give space to different ways of thinking and talking about gender um, and acknowledging the particular intersection um, that is um, the lives of folks who are both Indigenous and um, US LGBTQ+. Um, before I get more into it, I do want to introduce myself a little bit. Um, my name is Faye Johnstone. I use she and they pronouns. Um, you can use either one, um, mix it up, keep it fun, and that works for me. Um, with Wisdom to Action, I do a lot of our 2 LGBTQ inclusion work, um, so helping develop resources, 
um, for organizations on 2 LGBTQ inclusion, um, conducting community engagement initiatives, helping organizations uh, build their organizational capacity on 2 LGBTQ issues. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of doing that work um, specifically around inclusion, um, both with and without side of Wisdom to Action for about six or seven years now. Um, I'm also uh, on the board member of Kind Space, which is Ottawa's local LGBTQ community center. Um, and if you're in Ottawa, they're always worth checking out and supporting. Um, I have four ferrets, which everyone always needs to know about me. Uh, and if you ever happen to find me on any social media platform, I am sorry. It is both like great perspectives on LGBTQ rights and a lot of ferret photos, videos, and ramblings. Um, I also just got my MSW from Carlton, which is fun, and it's really nice to be able to like add that nice little MSW after my name on occasions where relevant. Um, and yeah. Um, in terms of the organization I work for, uh, we are Wisdom to Action. Um, our focus is um, to facilitate change and strengthen communities. And so that is really the mission that we align ourselves around as uh, both a progressive consulting firm and a social enterprise. Um, and our, our real goal really is, is focused around that. We do not do work that we do not see as moving that needle forward. Um, and we do not do work that is not grounded in our very um, strong belief and values connected to anti-oppression, social justice, um, community engagement and self-determination and everything connected to that. Um, in terms of what we concretely do, um, our work revolves around knowledge mobilization resource development, tons of work in community and youth engagement. Um, we help make conferences more fun uh, and hopefully also more productive um, by doing things differently and bringing some creative facilitation to bear. Uh, we do a lot of work on trust LGBTQ inclusion and then um, evaluation research. Uh, traditionally, we do uh, we exist in the sectors of mental health, trust LGBTQ issues, uh, and, and more broadly in community-based um, services. Uh, and you can check us out on Twitter there. Um, before I actually start talking about 2SLGQ inclusion and we start going through that journey together, uh, I do want to do a few pieces of housekeeping just to acknowledge that um, you know your needs uh, and you know your body best. Um, I spent eight hours on Zoom yesterday. It's not something I enjoy repeating. Um, and I know many of us are often uh, feeling more tapped out uh, through virtual connection um, than we thought we would be at this stage. Um, so on that note, I do wanna thank everyone for joining today. Um, but also let you all know that you are welcome to do what you need to do to make this work for you. And if that, that's stepping out early, um, if that is hanging out in your PJs as you listen, or if that is um, having a big cup of coffee for the seventh time today, you know yourself best. Um, I also want to uh, encourage us to think about an anti-oppressive lens, intersectional lens throughout this conversation so that we don't um, do what we often do and silo different identities and communities um, without acknowledging how those, connect, those communities are fundamentally connected. Um, I do want to create a space, finally, that is uh, open for honest and hard conversations. Um, I often joke in my trainings uh, with social service providers that um, we are very, very um, nice people uh, much of the time, um, and we like the idea that we're nice. Sometimes that makes us too polite um, or makes us avoid hard conversations or being frank or blunt. Um, and in these kinds of spaces, I think we need to be able to have those conversations. Put it on the table and work our way through it. So I would encourage folks to bear that in mind as well. Now, to get actually into the workshop itself, um, our objectives today are to uh, explore the current state of 2SLGQ community health and well-being, explore gaps and opportunities within how we're approaching inclusion right now in the sector, uh, explore a new approach, um, that is based in implementation science uh, and has a huge investment in community engagement and anti-oppression, and then use some or gain some tools to actually put into practice um, so we can start jumping into it and doing the work uh, that desperately needs doing. Uh, this is a slide that I was very happy to be able to write. Um, as someone who does a lot of like 2S LGBTQ 101 workshops uh, and sees the value in them, um, because everyone needs those, in, like the introductory building blocks. Um, I didn't want this to be that workshop. Um, the intention of this workshop is not to go over like, the core concepts of LGBTQ identities. Um, I am not going to go through a slide on um, what every word means, uh, what gender is, what sexuality is. Um, I'm open to questions on those things because everyone is learning, um, but I do want us to focus ourselves around the objectives in the previous slide 
um, because we are talking not just about our own individual capacity here, um, but about our organizational capacity and how we can build that capacity uh, to guarantee that we are providing the kinds of services that all of our clients uh, and all folks in our communities deserve when they walk in the front door. Um, to ground us in why this is an important conversation, I wanted to start by looking at some of the unfortunate statistics around to us LGBTQ health and well-being. Uh, I want to preface this by saying that um, we often create this idea of like the helpless or marginalized community um, or the community that is like intrinsically more likely to experience things that are bad. Um, so for example, to us LGBTQ young folks have a higher rate of mental health problems. That statement in and of itself is relatively values neutral, but different people read different things into that. People will read into that that um, gays, colloquially, uh, and to us LGBTQ communities more broadly, uh, are just more likely to have that. And that's just a thing that happens when you have like a different gender or sexuality. Um, but we know that the health outcomes in our communities cannot be separated from violence, from the way in which our society, our political and economic institutions think about and teach about our identities. Uh, and so the trans folks have higher rates of mental health problems. Trans folks also get harassed a lot. Trans folks also experience housing uh, discrimination. Trans folks all, um, also experience violence of all sorts. And so we need to be able to understand that context because that in explains and demonstrates the intricate connection to um, between oppression and health when it comes to TSLG communities. Um, so what we do know, unfortunately, is um, not a ton. We don't have good data in Canada on to us LGBTQ communities. Um, we are getting better. We have some groundbreaking research that's come out this year uh, around the health of our communities that has been um, a, a godsend to many of us doing this work. Um, but we, we need more data um, more generally to better understand the issues we're talking about um, and the prevalence of different issues in our communities. But what we do know generally is that 20 to 40 percent of homeless young folks identify as to us LGBTQ+. Um, about 48% of trans folks make under $29,000 a year, um, which if you think of, and 24% of those folks make under $15,000. Uh, if you think about that, that is a significant overrepresentation of our communities um, in uh, unemployment and in uh, poverty and in low income communities. Um, and uh, that is in fact, despite the fact that trans folks are just as likely, and I believe in some cases more likely to pursue post-secondary education, uh, but that does not translate into uh, livelihoods that are, um, well, middle class, um, where folks have the, the, what they need to make to ends meet. Um, finally, 48% of trans folks, uh, or sorry, 84% of trans folks have avoided at least one public space because of harassment or fears of. I don't know a trans person who doesn't avoid certain spaces. Um, I wish I did. I think that would be awesome. Um, but the reality of living while trans in this wonderful society of ours is that that's not often, you're not often safe in all of the public spaces as others might expect themselves to. Um, more, more specifically, talking about community health and social services, um, we have seen some really interesting uh, and phenomenal developments um, in how these services um, have engaged with 2SLGTQ inclusion. If you go back a few decades ago, uh, and I'm talking like the 50s, 60s, and 70s here, um, it was not a really good relationship between our communities and any of these institutions or these institutions um, as like an abstract as ab abstract entities. Um, there was a ton of uh, pathologization of our identities, lots of discrimination, lots of homophobia and transphobia, lots of bad times. Um, and that has shifted. Uh, and shifted in some very positive ways. Um, I think when we started entering the 2000s, as Canada was more actively, you know, talking through this question of marriage equality and what that meant, et cetera, um, we saw organizations really uh, taking up um, a commitment to uh, to us LGBTQ inclusion, though we wouldn't have used necessarily that acronym to describe it at the time. A gay inclusion, LGBT inclusion, um, and so over the past two decades, in particular, we have seen a huge increase in the ability of broadly community health and social services to support to us LGBT communities. We've, we have come a very long way and I think it is important to give credit to that. Um, our services are better than they have been and we have seen evolutions of how we talk about gender and sexuality and, and more training and more capacity building and education and more programs and those are phenomenal things. Nevertheless, we've still got issues. Um, we've made some great gains but there are still barriers um, every step of the way. 
Um, and frankly, a lot of service uh, of, of community members still experience explicit discrimination when accessing care. And if it's not explicit, there are a lot of things that take place when a young person or a community member who is 2 lgbtq accesses services um, that are less than ideal and present m barriers that are small, but after enough become insurmountable, or inconveniences or awkward moments, um, little moments of hurt or pain when somebody makes a mistake. And those, those are mistakes that will happen. Um, but it is unfortunately the truth that at this point, we are not able broadly to guarantee that a 2 lgbtq community member walking through the doors of most of our services um, are able to have a genuinely affirming and inclusive experience every step of the way. We are better than we have been, but I feel like many of us acknowledge that we aren't able to promise that. Um, we often do. We often nonetheless say, yeah, we are 2 lgbtq inclusive. And then we set up an expectation that we're going to be great, and then we make mistakes. And again, those mistakes happen. They are not bad things fundamentally. But if you're going to demonstrate or indicate a commitment to 2 lgbtq inclusion and state that we are, in fact, inclusive, um, we need to be able to guarantee that fact. We need to be able to stand by it and demonstrate and evaluate it um, to make sure that we're actually doing justice to what we're saying we're doing. And so all of this brings us to today. Um, I would say broadly that the um, current approach to inclusion in most community health and social services um, is the LGBT 101. Um, it is a workshop where you bring somebody in for an hour to an hour and a half. If you go to two hours, you're getting lucky. Um, and you have maybe 20 to 30 of the staff in the room, and you spend that time, that hour or so, um, talking about what the word gay means, what trans means, what a pronoun is, all of the basic pieces. Um, those are not bad workshops. Those are important workshops. We need, I wish everyone had those workshops, um, but they are only the first step. Uh, they are the first of many steps necessary to ensure that everybody is actually on the same page and has the knowledge and tools that they need to do their job well. Um, when organizations implement new approaches or new programs, they don't just say, all right, staff, we're going to come to a one-hour info session and we'll give you some basics and then we'll assume that you can all use this new customer relationship management software. That's not how we do it. We implement it. We say, um, okay, so we're going to do some training. We're going to slowly onboard staff. We're going to get folks used to the core features before we bring in new components. We have these processes. We evaluate those processes. We haven't done that for inclusion. We haven't done that for 2 LGBTQ inclusion specifically. And so right now, organizations usually bring in somebody every year or two for a LGBTQ 101 workshop. I know this because I have spent uh, the last seven years of my life often giving those LGBTQ 101 workshops. Um, organizations often also do like small amendments in their org policies, um, changing HR stuff to ensure workplace dis uh, discrimination efforts uh, or workplace protections for, or protections for workplace discrimination. That is a mouthful. Um, but unfortunately, most of it ceases there. Um, most organizations don't go beyond that. Um, and if they do, it is usually because there are some really great people, usually but not always members of 2SLGQ communities themselves in these spaces, who push it forward. And so it's not working. Um, it's we have, Our approach, we're stuck in the mud. Uh, we've, we kept trying to do the same thing and thinking that it would change everything, and it didn't. And we didn't think about it strategically, and we got stuck. And so we're now stuck in a situation where we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one workshops that don't have enough time to really unpack what staff are dealing with in terms of stigma and biases. Um, if somebody has an idea that every that the trans people are more likely to be mentally ill and can't be trusted, you can't unpack and address that in an hour. Um, you can't, you just, you, an hour is not enough time. Uh, if there are folks who think that non-binary people accessing shelters that are gendered is a faux pas, is terrible, is the worst thing and a threat to insert something, you can't deal with that in an hour. And a lot of people, you can't even create a space where people can say those things. If somebody has an issue with non-binary people accessing shelters in your organization, you need to talk about that. You need to talk about if that person is able to perform based off established expectations of their role and not, and still ensure that non-binary folks are able to access these shelter spaces and not communicating that to the client. You need to make sure staff have those pieces of knowledge. Um, you also need to customize training. You can't just do the same training for different kinds of organizations or different sectors. The needs of somebody providing intake in a harm reduction or in a, in a shelter are very different from a public health nurse. And the training information, the way in which they receive it, the way in which they put it into practice 
changes, but we don't account for that. We also don't account for the need for broader organizational cultural change. To look at and reflect on our policies and our processes, um, the federal government has been doing this whole like gender-based analysis plus thing, um, where they're trying to look at their, pro uh, their programs and their work through a gender-based lens. And we need to be doing that on 2 LGBTQ inclusion on our community levels as well. Um, unfortunately, inclusion is now framed as learning the right words and little more. If you know what the word trans means and the word genderqueer and you know what a pronoun is, you are good to go. And that, unfortunately, isn't enough. It doesn't give people tools. It doesn't actually make people comfortable dealing with really complicated concepts like gender and sexuality. A lot of folks might have the right words, but if somebody walks in the front door and describes themselves as a, a trans woman um, with a, or what's a better example? Um, somebody who describes themselves as, as a genderqueer, non-binary, um, trans femme, and they don't know what that means, but they will, if they haven't had more deep training than that, they'll be stuck, they'll be confused, they'll be caught off guard. They won't be able to ask the right questions of what does that mean in this context? Or how can I better refer to you and ensure I'm using the right language and the right pronouns? They won't know how to navigate those things because we've been teaching inclusion as a dictionary instead of a practice, instead of a process, instead of a, a, a tool and a skill that we develop and refine. So, oh, yes, correct. Um, in terms of what, so to shift gears and you know move away from what we are doing now and explore what we can do differently. Uh, and in order to do that, um, Wisdom to Action sought funding from the Sandbox Project, um, a phenomenal organization um, that works around youth health and um, provides micro grant funding to, uh, for unique collaborations. Um, and through that funding, we partnered with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, the um, Center of Excellence for, the Ontario Center of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health, and Parenthood Toronto, Children's Welfare League of Canada, so the wonderful uh, folks who are hosting today, uh, the Canadian Teachers Federation and Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights, um, kind of to explore what a new way of doing this work could be. Um, the partners that we reached out to were folks um, who had different perspectives in the community health and social service sector, um, folks who could speak to uh, broader provincial issues, but also folks who could speak to what it's like in a classroom or providing a frontline service. Um, and it also brought together folks who are used to working in change management and used to helping organizations think intentionally about implementing new programs or processes. And so we put our heads together um, to kind of scope out what an implementation-based approach to us LGBTQ inclusion could, uh, should, and would look like. Um, and two products came out of that um, which are a part of why um, we wanted to make this webinar happen in the first place. Um, and I'm hoping we can pass around the links to those following this. Um, and I'll, I'll refer to them again so you can know where to find them on our website. Um, but the two resources are first, a call to action, um, specifically for the youth, in, the youth serving sector, but applicable across community health and social services. And the call to action sought to articulate what we should be, what, what is, or sought to articulate the standard we should all be striving towards. It sought to, if we're trying to raise the bar on 2 LGBTQ inclusion, it tried to say what that bar actually should be. And so it was a visioning document that both sought to acknowledge where we are now and acknowledge the histories of the good work that has been done, um, but also the histories of 2 LGBTQ inclusion not being what it needs to be, uh, and, and then demonstrate or indicate what where we could go from here. What could, um, what could it look like? have a real commitment to 2 LGBTQ inclusion at the very core of all of our organizations. Now, the second resource um, is actually the one that I'm most excited about. Um, and it sought to articulate what that actual approach would look like. How do we take an organization from wherever they are on this journey towards 2 LGBTQ inclusion and provide a structure and process they can work through to get, get it done and get it done right? to really ensure that 2 LGBTQ inclusion was implemented holistically, comprehensively, and with evidence in a way that makes sure service providers can use it right and organizations are truly ready to go. And so that uh, tip sheet, that resource, um, is going to be the focus of a few of my slides in, in, in a couple moments um, to walk through what that looks like in practice. The last piece on this is that we really tried to frame both of these resources, uh, again, similarly to this webinar, as not just a 2S LGBTQ Inclusion 101 resource, but targeted at 
people who are change champions in their organizations, folks who are in management or senior leadership or board level positions, folks who are coordinators who have the ability to look at their own programs. It was really intended not to be about individual practice change, but program policy and organizational change. And my hope is that it can serve as a loose rubric because it's not meant to be a rigid process, but a loose rubric to guide how organizations uh, do this work and maybe help them strengthen uh, and critically um, analyze the work that they're already doing to find ways to be more effective and to do this work uh, a little bit better and make it a little bit more. Um, again, I like my disclaimer slides apparently for this webinar, um, but we can't do 2SLGPQ inclusion without the right time and the right resources. Um, it is not enough, uh, and this, this is part of why um, we've always done these one-off workshops. It's, it's easier to do it, they look good, and they don't cost much money. Um, we need to demonstrate that we are actually prioritizing inclusion work, um, both because it's the right thing to do, and also because intense organizational implementation is more cost-effective and effective organizationally in the long run. It leads to better services for communities. It leads to better understanding and knowledge for staff. And in the end, it is more effective to do it this way than to continue an endless cycle of LGBTQ 101 workshops. Um, there is no one and done approach to this issue nonetheless. Um, we need sustained efforts. We need to be able to not just, you know, a year after our first efforts, but three years down the road, four or five years down the road, assess where we're at because our staff culture shifts depending on who's in the room. Um, our staff has turnover and we have new folks who are here. And so if we don't have a plan for maintaining the baseline knowledge, we need to be able to evaluate and see if we have to go back and rebuild some, some key elements. Um, the last thing is that mistakes can and do happen. The thing that terrifies me, genuinely terrifies me when I talk about 2 LGBTQ inclusion in our sectors is that people will start doing the work and they'll make a mistake and they'll step away, they'll step out and never step back. Um, we need people who will stick around. There will be moments when your organizations make mistakes. Those will be awkward. Some of them will suck. Some of the time you will get an icky, icky, guilty feeling in your gut. That guilty feeling might be appropriate sometimes. Uh, it might be important to reflect on our ability to um, step away from that discomfort and say, okay, it's fine, it's done. Um, it might be not a fun experience, but we need to stay in those conversations because the only ways we can be accountable for, for our mistakes is by changing our practices. The only way that we can really do this work right is by sticking through it, even if it's uncomfortable. And finally, there are histories to take, keep in mind. Our histories of our organizations not always being the best, not just now, and maybe we're doing okay now, but five years ago, 10 years ago, those histories are in the room with you the histories of community health and social services more broadly of these sectors which have historically pathologized, medicalized and institutionalized our community members. Those histories are in the room with you. And so if a mistake is made, it is on top of those histories. And so there are emotions there for community members. There are reasons that community members feel hurt and like to indicate or demonstrate that hurt. So we need to be aware of that. And we need to be aware of that in our response. And we need to know that at the end of the day, we need to stay in these conversations. We need to keep doing the work because the work needs to get done. So what exactly is an implementation-based approach? Uh, it's one of those funny things that I think is like, we're talking about it a lot in the sector right now. Uh, and it's been interesting for me to watch um, the evolution of an implementation-based approach to blank. Uh, and I think it's been a good evolution. I, I, I genuinely do, but I think we also use use it without actually thinking through what it is. Uh, and so my my take on an implementation based approach is that it is a way of looking at organizations as complex systems, um, not just in terms of their policies and their processes, but in terms of their people, uh, in terms of how their people relate to one another, in terms of how they create a workplace culture together. So an implementation based approach is basically a way of looking at those systems and thinking through every step you need to make the adjustments, every little edit, every little change, to put in a new practice and make it stick, and make it something that becomes a core part of the organization. We already do this a lot of the time. Um, I think I said a bit about this earlier, but imagine when we're implementing a new assessment tool. 
Um, organizations, um, and this is a bit of a dig, but it's a nice one. Um, organizations will spend thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars bringing in a new assessment or hiring a consultant for a strategic plan. When they do that, they um, when they do that, they um, have uh, an implementation process. They um, have the consultants bring a plan forward. They have this whole approach to make sure that they're developing a good strategic plan. They're talking to the right people, consulting with the right stakeholders, analyzing in the right ways. All of those things happen. When we're bringing in a new assessment tool, we're doing the exact same thing. We are doing training. We are doing onboarding. We are doing um, a, sta a staggered implementation that follows a plan and a strategy that we've carefully thought through and allocated sufficient funds for. But we don't, and we balk at doing that for 2 sl inclusion. Very few organizations have actually hired folks who have expertise in 2 sl inclusion to go through your organizations and build or, or correct and improve processes and policies to answer the questions that your frontline staff members may have about your new pronoun policy, to do all of those pieces. Um, and so we can take that same approach that we think about when we do implementation of a needs assessment program or tool, and we can add it um, to our approach to SLGBTQ inclusion. We can look at our policies and our procedures, and then we can implement slowly with ongoing engagement with staff to troubleshoot problems. We can evaluate our approach um, by doing staff surveys and assessment and, and checking what knowledge staff feel they still need. We can make changes to the tools that we're using around pronouns to make sure they reflect staff feedback and that staff are able to use them in a way that seamlessly integrates with the rest of their work. We don't do that right now. It's all one-offs and it's not part of a plan or strategy, or it very rarely is. An implementation of a based approach operates through everything, all of the processes that we do for similar things, and it takes an intentional uh, process to implement a new practice in a way that makes it stick and does justice to everybody in the organization, the very learning, sp uh, learning speeds, and the needs of their local 2S LGBTQ community. As I've said, and as I think is very important to emphasize, there is no one size fits all approach. Um, all orgs are different. The needs of their service providers will vary massively, as will the needs of their local 2S LGBTQ communities. Uh, in an urban center like Ottawa, the needs of a 2S LGBTQ person are going to vary so much from the needs of a rural 2S LGBTQ community member. Um, somebody who is white will have a different experience accessing our services and have different needs uh, depending or relating to the two such identities than somebody who is racialized. These are factors we need to be able to adapt to and to be flexible around. And to take into consideration when we're creating programs and policies. And so there is no one size fits all that solves all problems. Um, this implementation based approach is not meant to be like a prescriptive, rigid, you have to follow every step exactly as we've said you have to. Uh, it is meant to be a process that's flexible that adjusts for your organization's needs. And we've actually built it to be as much around you reflecting with local communities on what you need to do as us telling you what you might want to consider doing. And now uh, we will jump right into it after my next sip of coffee. So this is our proposed very like high level approach. Um, there is a much more in-depth walkthrough in the resource itself. It has a page plus for almost every tip, uh, and it goes into a, a, a greater devil, uh, level of detail and provides more like practical insights than I will today. Um, but my hope really was to um, kind of go through the concept overall, talk through where we've come from, and where we need to head, and then actually, you know, see what this looks like in practice. So what I'll do now is I'm going to walk through these pieces, uh, and then um, hopefully folks will explore other option opportunities to, um, through the resource itself, broaden their knowledge or explore what this looks like more concretely. Um, so first, our first step that we proposed is preliminary staff and organizational capacity building. And the reason for this is that you actually, you really do need that baseline. If somebody in your organization does not know what the word gay means, you have a problem because you cannot begin building a process around 2 LGBTQ inclusion before all of your staff know what language you're using um, what um, a gender is, what a sexuality is, what a pronoun is, because those very, very core universal um, aspects of 2 subject inclusion are necessary to make sure you do the next six steps right. And so the first steps are bring in a 
two or three hour, not a one hour, but a two or three hour 2S LGBTQ inclusion educator and provide some basic training and begin reflecting on what your space could do to immediately embed some 2S LGBTQ inclusion aspects. What that looks like is um, if you are, uh, if you have bathrooms on your in your facility, make them gender neutral, just like literally put up a washroom sign um, start talking more about pronouns, like do some of those preliminary things where you think through what this might look like and what the actual practice changes are, and that prepares you for step two. We can't do this work without making sure 2S LGBTQ communities and organizations are right there at the table with us. We, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot. There's no way to do this work if we are not talking to members of the communities we are working around. Nothing about us without us, 2S LGBTQ communities need a seat at the table. The way that you can do that is by A, reaching out organizationally to other two, uh, to, uh, to 2S LGBTQ um, organizations in your community. There is definitely at least one um, in almost every community. Uh, you might have to hunt for them if you're rural or if you're not in a very urban center, you, they might be a pride organization that's volunteer run. Um, they might be a uh, HIV AIDS organization that has a big focus on 2S LGBTQ communities. They might be your Violence Against Women Shelter that is just really committed to doing that work and doing it well. Reach out to those organizations and see if you can build relationships with them. Get to know how they work and what their needs are. Begin to understand um, what the state of 2S LGBTQ community health and social services looks like um, in these contexts. In order to do this work, I do recommend organizations creating a 2S LGBTQ inclusion advisory committee. I think this should be comprised of staff leadership, st frontline staff members, and community members, as well as, if at all possible, representations for, uh, representation from local 2S LGBTQ community organizations. You need these folks to be able to, A, help you, guide you, provide insight. If a few of them are folks who are former clients, A+. Plus. These folks are the ones who will help guide your journey, who will help weigh in and make sure you're doing this work right. Um, and make sure that you're being accountable to community while you do it, and to make sure community is at the table. And the ripple effect from engaging these folks is how you build trust with broader communities. I think that service providers don't realize consistently how connected local to us LGBTQ communities are, uh, and how aware these organizations that are community-based, like 2S LGBTQ community organizations, how aware we are of the issues that organizations might have. I can give you a ramble on like a dozen organizations in Ottawa and the state of 2S LGBTQ inclusion in their context, um, both because I've worked with them, but also because I know people who access their services. and I know what happens because community members talk to each other. If you bring us into those processes and demonstrate to us that you're committed to this work, not only will we engage in good faith and say, hell yeah, we want to help make that happen. If you acknowledge the unique contributions and compensate folks in respectful ways um, and are genuine in your intent, but we will also help you build trust. We will help community members realize that yes, you are committed to doing this work. 2S LGBTQ community organizations will be more likely to refer clients who are in desperate need of your services to you because they know they can trust you. Those relationships are the core around, around which everything 2S LGBTQ inclusion has to pivot because again, nothing about us without us. Once you have engaged an advisory committee or created a mechanism to ensure 2S LGBTQ communities are actively engaged in these conversations, and that you're actively engaged in 2S LGBTQ community spaces by attending prides, by putting out statements for trans safe remembrance, by being a participant um, and just being there in good faith. Once you've done those pieces, my proposed or our proposed next step is an audit. And that is where it gets fun. An audit is you literally looking at your organization, honestly assessing how, what your capacity is around 2S LGBTQ inclusion. That includes surveying your staff to assess their current perspective on their own knowledge. How do they rate their capacity to support 2S LGBTQ service users? How do they rate their capacity to support trans service users? Um, are what are their knowledge needs? What do they want more information around? What do they think the gaps are? What do your staff think the gaps are in your organization's 2S LGBTQ inclusion efforts? What do community members think are the gaps? What does your board, what does your board look like when it comes to 2S LGBTQ community members? If you, like that is the big step in its own way. It is the honest look and appraisal and the process of gathering every source of information you can on 2S LGBTQ inclusion 
And then step four is bringing all of that data together, analyzing it, and then using it to inform your next steps. What that means or what that looks like is if step four is creating a strategy, it's then actioning step five to provide inclusive, uh, comprehensive training. And it's acknowledging that your staff, that your audit identified that your housing staff need more specific training on how to navigate conflict management. Um, if a trans client uh, or if a cisgender client is not comfortable in a space with a trans client, that training comes out of your audit. That audit identifies in your strategy that there is a gap in a particular area of knowledge that is very important for your staff to have and allows your inclusion facilitator to provide customized, relevant education and tools to solve that issue. An audit also, or a strategy also includes an intentional review of your programs to identify areas where you might be normalizing concepts that aren't particularly great these days, like a really rigid gender binary. Um, and it, it includes in the strategy aspect saying, okay, how do we strengthen or adapt this? How do we shift it? And then all of this is filtered back up to your advisory committee so that that advisory committee is looking at and actively participating in the audit, is creating the strategy, and is working with you and your staff are accountable to them in terms of implementation of the strategy itself. Step five also includes thinking critically about other aspects of education. For example, how are you going to prepare for new staff? How do you make sure that your new staff have the same baseline knowledge of 2S LGBTQ inclusion as you do? There are some great ways to do that. You can hire somebody to do a three hour webinar, break that up into three sessions as your basic building blocks. Um, you can do some staff sharing. You can have a local, like a positive space network in your organization that offers um, a workshop every six months or has a sit down with new staff to do a onboarding around 2 LGBTQ inclusion. But it's processes like that, thinking through from a strategic organizational level, what are the steps you need to take to get to that gold standard? That is the hard, I think I keep saying everything is the hardest step. None of these steps are easy, um, but each of them needs to be taken as its own distinct step to inform what comes next and to make sure that every step of the way you're using data from your own community and context um, to inform what a strategy looks like, to inform training, to inform future program review, and to inform um, your partnerships on Twist LGBTQ issues, and everything that goes from there. Step six um, is the exploration of Twist LGBTQ specific programming. And I think this is one that I really wish more organizations would um, reflect on, because I think it's a step that few have actually considered. Even organizations that have provided and gone through extensive journeys on inclusion, often haven't thought through step six. Uh, my understanding of 2 LGBTQ community services is that there aren't enough of them. They are less funded than most communities and social services out there. Um, they are doing the best that they can and they could probably use some friends. Um, explore partnerships with their organizations. And this actually, this step can take place at any stage. Um, step six can include uh, seeing if the local community health center that is focused on 2SLQ, like the, the local 2SLQ um, community center, um, wants to partner with y'all so that they can have one of your counselors in their space once a week. So that they can provide counseling services to 2SLQ communities without having to hire a new person because they don't have the budget on their one staff person budget. Um, step six can, uh, is also connected in my mind to step two. Um, in the sense that in the step two, you are engaging with and putting yourself out there um, around to such communities and, to, uh, and community organizations. Um, and when you're connecting with organizations, you should try to find networks you can join that are to LGBTQ um, service partner networks. Find the, the community tables, the spaces that the um, community organizers and, or, uh, and organizations use to talk about and advocate for their issues. Um, and join those spaces and support those pieces of work but also consider just offering them some stuff. Like literally, like offer them some space if you have a boardroom that is free once a week. Find ways so that you can bring them into your organization and you can bring your folks into theirs in ways that maximize your resources and target um, a population that doesn't have um, access to services in the way that many others do. Um, and the last piece I'll say to that is that a lot of the time 2 LGBTQ communities are more likely to trust it if it is in partnership with a local 2SLTQ uh, community organization. 
Uh, and so making those relationships um, also means that you're more likely to reach the service users that you might be missing. Um, because despite the fact that we know 20 to 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ+, um, a lot of them aren't actually showing up in our shelters. And there's reasons for that. And maybe if they saw something that was branded with the local community center that we know has a youth program every Wednesday that like 70 youth come to and a lot of them are street involved and you don't really know where they're sleeping. Well, maybe if you partner together, those folks will get the housing they need because they might not have trusted a service that they have an access that isn't explicitly connected to their identities. The last step, step seven, is uh, also one that we often miss. It's the process of evaluating, measuring, and refining our inclusion efforts. It's the process of making sure that after a training, we assess how the staff learn and what they learn. Um, it's a, you can do a simple pre and post test for a four hour to a subject inclusion workshop and have some new under, knowledge around your measures and your efforts. You can also do a survey once every year or when you're doing your broader staff survey, which many of your orgs are likely already doing or should be doing uh, to assess organizational needs and staff capacity and staff um, um, workplace happiness, et cetera. Um, add some questions around, uh, measurable questions around to us LGBTQ inclusion. Um, review it every year. Use that to inform what your next strategy year looks or what your next to us LGBTQ uh, strategy looks like. Evaluate, measure, and refine is crucial because otherwise we are all too likely to get right back to stuck in that roadblock of one workshop, one workshop, one workshop. If we aren't evaluating, if we aren't measuring, if we aren't refining, by which I mean building on and strengthening our education onto a subject inclusion and our policies, our programs and processes, in five years, we will be five years behind. We do not know where this journey is going to take us. Um, all of the concepts around gender and sexuality are new-ish to us. They're old ideas. They're ideas that aren't actually um, as new as we think they are, but a lot of us are adjusting to these concepts and the language is evolving. Um, doing this right and evaluating, measuring, and refining our efforts is the way that we make sure that this sticks, that staff are confident and competent, and that we as an organization are genuinely doing this work and doing this work right. I'm gonna take another sip of my coffee. Um, because I cannot cease talking and I forget to breathe. And my coffee's cold. Um, I'm gonna move on for questions in just a moment. Um, but before I do that, I do wanna just end on the next steps. What, what comes next? And my big thing and my ask, my call to action, I guess you could say, is for organizations to explore a deeper commitment to, to us LGBTQ inclusion and to think about what that looks like. Um, I think we need folks to push organizations to go beyond what they're doing now, um, to champion that we need individuals and organizations to champion this. It's hard work, it's important work, and if we do it right, it will lead to better health outcomes for all of our communities. It'll lead to a more efficient services, more efficient care. It leads to improvements across the board. It also builds our organization's like core capacity to work with different communities. There's a ripple effect. Building our capacity on us LGBTQ inclusion helps us be more comfortable with ideas of power and privilege, of oppression, of um, population health and social determinants of health. These are crucial to our organizations. At the end of the day, we just we need folks to be those champions. We need folks to advocate in their organizations to move beyond a one-on-one workshop, to allocate the funds needed to actually hire a consultant who can help you do this work, um, to be able to create a partnership and spend a bunch of funds to hire a social worker to work with your local LGBTQ organization. These are things that have costs. These are things that have organizational implications, financial, social, economic, or uh, political. These are hard conversations. We need folks to be willing to push them forward because I don't want to have conversations anymore. I don't want to do the same workshops anymore. I don't think we should be doing the same workshops anymore. We need to, as we have said, and as this workshop or this webinar is all about, raise the bar on us LGBTQ inclusion. The implementation of based approach is how we do it. Um, I would, of course, be remiss if I didn't talk a bit more about Wisdom to Action's work and our services. Um, we have a bunch of reports on us LGBTQ inclusion on our website. Um, they include uh, really great research looking at um, to us communities and gender-based violence and what those intersections look like. Um, we have these two Raising the Bar resources, which I think are my favorite resource I've ever helped create. 
Um, I think we've needed something that moves beyond the 101 um, and helps thinks, uh, folks think through what the rest of it can look like and what that process on inclusion can look like. Um, and so I'd recommend folks check that out. Uh, we've also got a ton of other stuff around mental health, um, anxiety management, um, equity literacy, and so much more out, up there. And so I'd recommend folks check that out as well. Um, you can also check out our services to support organizational implementation of 2 sl 2 inclusion. Um, most of that looks like capacity building and mentorship, uh, implementation support and auditing. Um, but we do everything from step one to step seven, and we are always happy to um, talk with organizations and explain what that, like, explore what that could look like. Um, and of course, if you ever do have questions um, or are looking for resources, I have too many 2SLTQ resources in my head um, that I'm happy to share with folks and pass along that other folks and ourselves have created. Um, so feel free to contact me at bay at wisdomtoaction.org. Um, you can also find me on Twitter. It's my Twitter name, or my name, Faye Johnson, is my Twitter account. Um, and I promise lots of cute ferrets will be featured. Um, and on that note, I am going to open it up for our Q&A and see if folks have any questions for me today. There are, there are a few questions in the chat, Faye. I don't know if you can, if you want to click on it and pull it up. Yes, I was missing. I couldn't, I didn't see it on my screen earlier. I was hiding it by accident. Uh, oh, okay. Let's see. Uh, nice. Okay. I am trying to make it so the box is big enough so I can see all of your questions or some of you. Okay, perfect. Let's do this. Um, so I'll read, I'll read a summary of the questions more or less, and then I will respond. Um, in public education, we have a lot of virtual learning, and there are concerns about school boards that have outed members of such communities um, or made them like they should not identify as they are. How would you recommend educators raise these issues with school boards? Um, I think, I don't know the particular like context of school boards and privacy legislation. I know that there have been a couple cases where school boards have uh, allegedly accidentally outed students to their classmates, uh, notably through um, a system that has legal names versus chosen names, where the legal names show up on their like virtual learning software. Um, I think those, that that is, um, there's a lot of harm caused in those moments that I don't think folks always know or realize that, um, because that can be dangerous for a kid. He, to the family potentially. Um, what if one of their classmates tells their parents and then that parent calls the kid's parent and the parent doesn't know that their kid is trans or is explicitly transphobic. Um, in terms of how to address this, I think educators need to advocate for a very, very clear po privacy policy and a very clear policy around legal versus pro uh, chosen or preferred names. You are backed up by Ontario human rights legislation in doing so and I encourage folks to look at the Toronto District School Board and the OCDSB, Ottawa Carleton District School Board, as they both have um, policies to these uh, to cover these issues. Uh, and I believe it is clear in provincial uh, education policy as well, um, as well as union policies. Um, but if folks have any questions, I, um, I'm happy to refer folks to folks in the OCDSB in particular um, who can provide more guidance on this. Um, in terms of uh, my next question, um, what do you say to service providers who are concerned that specialized to SLTQ programming perpetuates stigma? Um, my goal, my dream is two things. One, comprehensive community health and social services that are broad and for the public and are not community specific, that have 100% capacity to do to us LGBTQ inclusion at every step of their services. That is A plus. At the same time, we do need local to us LGBTQ specific services and programs. Notably, because we know that our communities often feel more connected to each other and want to be in spaces that are buy-in for us. Also, because we know that there are um, a lot of things that to, or, there are histories of distrust, unfortunately, uh, and a lot of the time, two SLT organizations are the most in tune, connected with, and able to respond to the needs of local communities. Uh, and that I think is a huge, huge value. And also, like marginalized communities deserve their own organizations that do the work with, for, and by them. Um, we deserve our own vehicles through which to advocate. Um, we deserve to be able to access care that isn't just like inclusive of our identities, but that we know shares identities with us. That actually uh, makes a difference in our care, our trust, our access to care in general. Um, to us, us two communities are less likely to access health and social services, and so we need, um, so if, if we know that services that are led by community make a difference, we need more of those services. 
Um, and also, uh, 2SMG community organizations are the most cost-effective services I've ever seen because they make a lot happen on like less than $200,000 to run a community hub for 2SMG communities and a variety of services year-round. Um, how do we make our present organizations care enough to implement these practices? That can be a fun process. Um, I don't have any promises, but I think persistence is key. I think data is key. Demonstrating the evidence that shows there is a unique and important way to do this work, or, or, or a unique, yeah, using the evidence, or using evidence to demonstrate that there is a need for this work to happen. Excuse me, um, I lost the question. Um, yeah, so I, I think essentially, like, um, you need to advocate internally, you need to show the numbers, you need to keep that conversation going and resort to staff allies as best as you can, bring other folks into that chat. Um, and then honestly, um, if you're, if you're, if it's other organizations and you're trying to champion their work, um, you're able to criticize them. Um, like honestly, organizations are not um, people. They are I, like you can be nice about it, but organizations are fit for critique. Organizations are institutions that cause harm and also cause good things to happen. They are not ambivalent entities, and we need organizations need to a be able to adapt and accommodate critique. Um, but respond to it, to respond to it and do justice to what communities that they are meant to serve are asking for. And so I think pressure does sometimes come into the conversation and it's not the best way for organizations to begin their inclusion journeys, but it is a way and I have seen it result in good work. Um, in terms of, oh Lord, this is a lot, y'all are question full, to, full of questions today, I love it. Um, in terms of monitoring and evaluation, um, there is all, I think that's more of a comment than a question, but it is difficult to monitor inclusive language um, when you are working with frontline staff. I think that when it comes to like intake people, they need the most work and you need to actually model it. I do um, Kate, or, uh, not, like role plays in my trainings with like particular program staff sometimes and I have a intake, I've done a, 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 a case where a intake worker um, had to deal with a bigoted person who got angry when they were asked what their pronouns were and did like a, a massive furious scene out of it. Doing that, like doing that role play, help that staff feel comfortable and confident enough to actually action the asking of pronouns and know how to respond if there was a conflict. Because we have those skills, we can we can manage those conflicts. We all, if we're working frontline, conflicts all the time happening. Crises are always happening. We just panic more around it because we're scared um, that we'll make a mistake on us LGBTQ inclusion, and we just need to learn and try and do it. Um, I'm going to pause now as I like scroll through the last of the questions. Um, but what I would say is, again, um, you will, you do have my email. Um, I can't promise that I will answer every single question. Um, and I can only do so much like consulting that is off the side of my desk. Um, but folks are always welcome to A, explore what a, like a partnership or a project or collaboration would look like. And I am happy to send resources and answer um, questions within scope as uh, and within reason of me getting to sleep at yeah. times and having my weekends once or twice a month. Okay. So hopefully uh, thank you so much for having me and I guess I'll turn it back over to you, Kara. Thanks, Faye. Yeah, we don't want to set you up to have to drink more than seven cups of coffee a day. Seven's the limit, right? <laughs> On a good day. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to say thank you. Uh, so thought provoking and really awesome. Um, as always, I've, I have to say I've come to expect uh, nothing less and uh, having the pleasure to really witness you in action over the past year or so. It was a, it was a year ago, almost to the day that we did our, our first partnership collaboration. And it's been really exciting to see where things have gone since then. I, I would say a couple of, of the pieces that resonated most with me at first, the, the need to build true i would say authentic relationships and community like that's that's where you start and and second the the need to stick with the discomfort of doing this work and i i would say through that lens especially through the moments where we're we're making mistakes and, and screwing up um really important pieces that i'm gonna take away and, and reflect on in, in my work so thank you thank you so much for being here and, and sharing these resources and, and insights with us we really appreciate it
Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to everyone who's attended and joined us today. I think my biggest message is please take the resources and put them to work. That is what they were created for. Uh, show them to your managers, your coworkers, um, and again, reach out if you have questions. And thank you for joining and thank you for CWLC and CASW for hosting today. Thanks, Faye. Thanks. Uh, very quickly, uh, sincere thank you, um, echoing uh, Faye's comments, sincere thank you to the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Uh, also want to rethink Wisdom to Action. We couldn't do this without you. And, and uh, a shout out as well to the Ontario Centre of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health. Finally, thank you to the audience. Your engagement has been really awesome. Um, your questions, super thoughtful. Thank you for being here. A very quick closing logistical note to say that uh, we'll make this webinar available on demand uh, starting in about 24 hours. So if you've missed any of the details that were presented or you're simply looking to come back and, and access the resources that we're going to make available to you, uh, this includes a, a copy of the slide deck. And I'll also make sure that we're adding the, the two documents that Faye spoke to in detail today. So you can come in, download those and, and take them away. Um, use them, share them broadly, um, and, and have them at the ready. Um, so yeah, just come back tomorrow uh, to access anything that, that you would like to. So with that, I'm going to sign us off. Thank you again, everyone, and take, take really good care.